Are you thinking about buying wholesale products or perhaps you're currently in the process of designing and want to manufacture a product overseas? Maybe you're looking into Alibaba as a platform and a solution to actually make that product that you envision. Well, in this video, we're going to dive into reasons why you should or should not be sourcing from Alibaba, as well as five key lessons and tips that you should definitely consider before purchasing and putting any money or time or effort into that process. So if you're a new visitor to this channel, I highly encourage that you guys hit that subscribe button located right down below and turn on those post notifications to be alerted of the latest video drops. We've also linked some notes and resources that you guys can use and that we mentioned throughout this video, which will continue helping you build your brand. On this channel, we help entrepreneurs build brands that impact the world, so let's get started. Over the years, we design and manufacture products in multiple countries, Mexico, US, China, Taiwan, and many other countries, cities, and states around the world. So we've had some experience in manufacturing and communicating those needs with our suppliers. So in this video, we're going to be breaking it down. So whether you guys are sourcing an apparel product, a hard good, or maybe even an electronic product like a drift car or a scooter, these are going to be lessons that you guys are going to want to take notes of in order to successfully navigate that process and reduce your chances of failure or just getting that bad batch. Now, the first question I want to ask you is, should you even be sourcing from Alibaba and suppliers like them? Now, the reason I say this is because you should always consider trying to source locally and trying to see if the product that can be created locally or in your country. Now, to expand on that a little bit, perhaps you're designing a product and if you are going to be working with a supplier overseas, there is going to be that language barrier as well as that time difference, as well as that understanding of what it is that you need. So if you're able to find somebody that you can work with in your country or perhaps a few states away, then you could personally travel to that area and actually work with them side by side to develop that idea that you have. When we were developing our bags and our game bag products, if we were to try to source that design overseas, it would have literally taken us a year to two years to actually get just that one design that we wanted. The reason being is because we had a lot of fabric types that we wanted to use, we had a lot of patterns, we had a lot of tweaking that we needed to do to each pattern to really have it fit the way that we wanted it to fit. So if you're trying to communicate these changes with the supplier overseas through email, a lot of that information is going to be lost in the mix. So you should always consider sourcing locally before going to an overseas supplier to at least fine tune the design and the small batch production of the products that you're creating. That way you can actually see them in real time. You can actually sell them in real time to customers in your area and you can get real time feedback before you go spending a couple thousand dollars to create a couple thousand products and then get something that's mediocre. Which leads us into the next lesson, which is communication is key. Now, when you're designing a product from the ground up, from your design to sketch to the actual production, the most important thing that you can produce and provide to the manufacturer and the person that's making your product is called a tech pack. A technical specification sheet essentially is another term for it, but what this does is it essentially allows you to call out important features, sizing, dimensions, or just important information that's related to the production of that garment or of that product. Tech packs are a great way to communicate exactly what it is that you want versus just telling them, hey, I want this mixed with a little bit of this, and then can you add a little bit of zippers and a little bit of trim? Because words can easily be lost in translation. So you always want to provide a visual representation of what it is that you're talking about in order for them to be able to take it to their person that's working on those designs and actually be able to explain it to them. Now, communication also consists of keeping your words short, concise, but to the point. Don't go rambling about a bunch of different things through an email if you are going to be working with a supplier overseas. Don't start writing a bunch of paragraphs hoping that they understand exactly what you meant because a lot of the times they're not going to be able to decipher everything that you're trying to say. So a tech pack is going to be key, it's going to be gold, it's going to be the way that you guys need to move forward if you're going to be working with an overseas supplier. So now that you're clear with your communication and you know what to produce, the next thing you need to do is actually source and choose the correct suppliers and manufacturers to produce your goods. Now, if COVID has shown us anything is that manufacturing and logistics can be held up at the ports. It could be held up in their country. They could have laid off a lot of workers. And now a lot of the jobs and products that you were hoping that you were going to get your hands on are going to be held up for months or even a year. Now, what this means is that you should always have backup suppliers in the mix to be able to go from one to the other if anything like this should happen in the future. 
Now, the most important thing with working with multiple suppliers is realizing that you need to start that communication early on in the process. So when you choose one supplier, always have at least two or three ready in the mix and communicating your needs with them so they at least know what it is that you're working on. Now, once you guys get that ideal product sample from your suppliers, you're able to ship it to the other two or three so everybody knows what product it is that you're creating. So if anything should happen where things are backed up, you can go to supplier two and say, hey, this is a product that we're making, we're back on. Right now, one of the biggest hit industries is the print on demand in the US and not because they are shutting their business down or because business is slow, it's actually the opposite. The demand has increased so much that it's hard for them to meet that demand and it's hard for them to scale up to meet the customers that they're now getting. So whenever it comes to working with suppliers, realize that at times your supplier could be really willing and open to working with you and doing everything that they need in order to get your business. But as soon as business ramps up and there's other customers that are producing volumes way higher than yours, they may move you to the back. So just be cognizant of that and always have some backup suppliers ready for you to move and navigate this crazy turbulent industry. Which leads us into the next lesson and that's requesting samples of the products that you guys are designing. Don't skimp out on this process. A lot of times people don't want to wait on the delay to get their sample and they just wanna to go to market or maybe the cost is a little too high. Sample costs vary between production and your minimums that you're ordering. Oftentimes they might actually be able to refund or give a credit towards the production if it's high enough. But the key here is to request that sample because you need a physical representation of what it is you guys have been communicating with, not just photos. You actually wanna be able to see it, touch it, smell it, feel it, wear it. You wanna be able to move around in it. You wanna be able to use it as, you, as the functionality intends. And if it doesn't work for some reason, you need to be able to actually provide those detailed notes and feedbacks on how to make it better. Now this is definitely gonna increase the time for you to get your final batch and this might increase your cost in the initial production run, but at the end of the day, the sample is gonna be the thing that is representing what's actually going on the factory floor, and if you're not getting your sample and providing that feedback, everything that falls in line in regards to manufacturing is gonna be on you. So now that you guys have confirmed that you're gonna get the right product, the next lesson that we're jumping into is payments and the ordering process. Now you need to be able to secure your payment and you need to be able to secure the order that you're placing in order to make sure that you're getting the right product in the right order. Now what I mean by this is that you might have communicated everything that you wanted, right? You did everything right. You created a tech pack, you created the specifications on email, you communicated through photos, WeChat, video chat, Snapchat, all these different chats, right? You guys like have dived in on exactly what it is that you wanted. And now comes a time when you have to submit the payment and you have to submit the order agreement, right? A lot of times manufacturers will give you this agreement that'll state this is how many products you're ordering, this is the potential delivery dates, this is our manufacturer warranties, et cetera, et cetera. In those agreements, you need to be sure that you include clauses or verbiage that states exactly what the product should function and do. Now what I mean by that is the first time that we got into this business, we placed an order of about $7,000 to $8,000 worth of zippers. Now the zippers were a key component of our product at the time, which was gonna allow us to make a customizable product that would interchange and evolve over the years. Now we realized that the zipper was so important, so we spent a lot of time in communicating with various uh, zipper manufacturers. And with those zipper manufacturers, we, we, uh, we talked to some of the big ones, some of the medium ones, some up and coming ones, and everyone in between. And essentially what we started to really discuss was, hey, can, can you guarantee that your zipper will interchange between production runs? Can the zipper be customizable and interchangeable between links, right, between chains? And a lot of the suppliers were a little hesitant to guarantee that. They would say, well, we can't necessarily guarantee that, but it will work. Right, But there was one supplier that said, yes, we can guarantee that. So we went with them. Now, when we ordered the batch, we made sure that in the agreement, it said they could be interchangeable and this is the amount of quantity that we're getting. Now, when we received that batch, the first thing we noticed is that we didn't receive the amount of zippers that we ordered. We were able to tell that with a weight-based method, which is gonna be featured in a recent video on our channel, which I highly recommend you guys do. Well, we were able to tell that they shorted us on a couple hundred yards worth of zipper chain. So we contacted them, said, hey, look, you guys are, you guys shorted us on this. And they said, well, we thought we did it right, but let's send you some more. 
Once we actually went to the manufacturing process, we found out that the zippers were not interchangeable on a longer, bigger batch production size. They were interchangeable within a few inches or a few feet, but when you got into the yards or into the meters or into like a bunch of different zippers all coming together, there was issues in the production run. So we were able to show that there was an issue and they were able to find out why that issue was happening. And since this company was on the come up and it was eager to do business and they promised that it was customizable, they were able to find out that zippers cooled and healed at different temperatures based on whether they made it in Japan or whether they made it in Mexico. It's little details like that that you don't know unless you're doing business. So for them, it was an expensive lesson because they had to refund our money because the whole part of the ordering process was it needed to do that function, which they promised it could, and it was written in the agreement. So before you guys finalize the agreements and submit your payments, make sure that you guys note down exactly what the product should do and be very clear with the manufacturer that it needs to be able to accomplish that. And that will help you in either getting refunds, credits, or having them make you a new batch to meet the demand of what it is that you need. But without those terms in place, you guys are essentially out of pocket. They could say, hey, we sold you zippers and you never mentioned in the agreement that it needed to do a customizable feature or whatever it might be. Um, so it's out of our hands, right? But when it comes to noting that down in a good agreement, you're able to say, no, it was clearly written. So the people that run the company will want to remedy the situation in order to make everyone whole. Now, once you finalize the agreement, the next thing is in actually submitting your payments to them. Now, when it comes to working with suppliers on Alibaba, there's a couple of different payment terms that you can create in order to make sure that you're somewhat being a little safe with how you're dispersing the money. The most common one is a 50-50 term, meaning that you place a 50% on the start of the production and a 50% once it's completed and they show you pictures and images that it's actually done and it's boxed up ready to go to you. That will help protect you from any potential scams or issues that may fall down the line because if you give them 100% of the money and then they don't produce the product, then you're out 100%. At least this way, you're only out 50% and you could start the process again and at least have another 50% of a budget, worst case scenario. Now, if you're doing a lot of business, if you're ordering a couple of thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of product, there's other payment terms you could work out, such as 33, 33, 33, which is 33 on the start of the production, 33 upon them sending you proof and validation that things were created, somebody was able to inspect it and said, these are your goods, and then 33% of the final order due upon you actually receiving and inspecting those goods. This will help you make sure that you're getting the product that you ordered and that it's actually right through and through. Now, if you receive the shipment and something's wrong, then they have to either address it, fix it, but that's why you're always withholding that last third of the payment. And then if you're ordering multiple times and you start building a relationship with these suppliers, always asking for net terms, whether it's net 30 or net 60 or net 90 on the final third or the final half of the payment will always help you with cash flow, allowing you to sell some product as you are actually receiving it. You could sell it and then pay the remainder of the balance to them within those 30, 60 or 90 days. Suppliers are open to payment terms. So always know that terms can be negotiated and don't be afraid to ask if they're open to that. This especially applies if you're doing any type of deal outside of the platform whether they want you to do a wire transfer or they want to circumvent the Alibaba platform fees and they want you to pay directly to their bank. This is one of the scenarios in where you definitely want to negotiate terms and definitely protect your, your, your investment, which is not recommended that you go off the platform because there are a lot of scams, which leads us into the final lesson, and that is in how to avoid scams. Now, if you're serious about your business and you want to protect your investment in the products that you're developing, the very most important thing that you need to do is actually research the person and the business that you're actually talking to online. Now, there's various ways to research them. The first is just asking them, where is the factory located? Where are your offices located? What is the company website? Um, with that information, you're able to go on Google Maps, you're able to go on their website, and you're able to actually call the office to see if somebody answers there that is aware of the situation and the conversation that's happening between you and that person on Alibaba. Oftentimes, there's a lot of scammers out there who are posing to be part of the company that they're representing on Alibaba. So what happens is they give you all the information they need, they give you photos of the products that the factory actually posted on their website or something else. And now they're communicating with you and telling you that they're gonna get you amazing prices. 
So the very first thing you need to do is you need to call the company and make sure, hey, does this guy work for you? Is he an actual rep of your business? And if they say, we have no idea who that person is, chances are you're getting scammed. So in order to avoid the most common one, always make sure you're doing a legit check on that manufacturer. Now, if the manufacturer doesn't come up online, then that's also another red flag you're gonna need to investigate before you continue moving forward. And more importantly, guys, if it seems too good to be true, chances are it is. If the prices are crazy different, if you quoted, one guy quoted you 22, 25 bucks, and now this guy's saying he can do it for five, but you have to order a little bit more, chances are it's probably a scam or something to really look into. Maybe they're gonna cheap you on the supplies. Maybe they're gonna change your goods last minute. Always know that there's people out there that are gonna try to scam you on Alibaba. And the best thing that you could do for yourself is do the back end research to make sure that the company you're doing business with is actually in business. So there you have it guys. I hope that this information helps bring some clarity and helps you navigate the ordering process through a platform like Alibaba. Sourcing for manufacturers is perhaps one of the most exciting parts of actually building your brand. It's the time where your idea finally meets reality and you're able to see the fruit of your efforts finally come to life. It's also one of the most exciting, daunting, and challenging parts of the process because it does take a lot of communication back and forth, design concepts, reiterations, all this other stuff that you need to do to actually bring it to where you want it to be. And for that reason, it could be overwhelming and it could seem like you're spinning your wheels because you're not able to get what you want. And for that reason, we actually created From the Ground Up Academy, which is an A to Z program that helps you actually design, come up with an idea, actually create a business, actually market, manufacture, and navigate the entire apparel industry. And we have it available on a monthly program as well as a yearly fee. So if you're interested in learning more about it, I welcome you to download the free resources and guides that we have right down below, which will help you get started in the process and seeing if it's a good fit for you. Now, for those of you guys who are new to this channel, I highly encourage that you just hit that subscribe button and I invite you to look at the videos that are on our channel, which will continue helping you build your brand and business from the ground up. So I'll see you guys on the next one.